My name is Tori McGowan. I'm an emergency physician with St. Charles Medical Group in Central Oregon. I also serve as the Surf P physician for the Oregon Air National Guard, so that's our C. Bernie Enhanced Force Response Package. We do hazardous materials uh, response as well as an all, hazard, all hazards disaster response unit. Here at ASEP, I spoke about rural disaster management as well as mass casualty management. That draws on my experience as an emergency physician in the Air Force. I spent 21 years in the Air Force and I still am active in the Oregon Air National Guard. Deployed twice, once to Iraq and once to Afghanistan. The rural disaster management uh, speech that I gave talked a lot about being the only doctor in the hospital when a disaster happens. I work in a critical access hospital. We have 11 beds on our best day. And trying to respond to a disaster in a rural incident is a really tough thing because when we think about mass casualty events, it's great if you have 15 doctors that you can bring to bear on the problem. For 70% of the time, I'm the only physician in the hospital and there's no one else. So how do you maximize the single physician to respond to a disaster? Preparing for a disaster is incredibly important. Looking through your mass casualty plan and making sure that it makes sense, knowing what your threats are, I live in the western United States, so I know that wildfires are a big issue for us. So we make sure that we have a wildfire response plan. When I was stationed in the military at Travis, we were half a mile from the Clorox plant. So we did a lot of chlorine gas release exercises. So we knew exactly what to do when that actually happened and we had our mass casualty from that event. Looking at what's in your area, knowing what your threats are and knowing who your partners are can be really important because you need to know how to move patients and where you're going to move them when something happens. If you are the only physician in the hospital and that event comes, you need to know how to activate your help. So you need to know how to get in touch with your emergency managers who are the people that connect you with the incident command system and help you get resources to your hospital. You need to know how to get a hold of your administrators who will bring resources and personnel to you, but if you're the only person there, you're going to be alone for probably about two hours as mobilization starts and as they try to get help to you. And that's assuming that the roads are passable. If there's a natural disaster, no one may be able to get to you. If you're the only physician in the facility, working at the top of your license is incredibly important. There are a few things in any type of patient care that only the docs can do, and that's the procedures and the high level of medical decision making. Everything else you have to delegate down to the lowest level. And you need to keep that idea of working at the top of your license for not just you, but for your nurses, for your medics, for everybody else. Do the things that only you can do and delegate the rest on down. When I work in my disaster response unit, all of my medics are trained to get somebody onto a monitor, put an IV in place, get them exposed, and do a primary and secondary survey. So I can stand in the middle of my trauma bay and watch that happen to six patients at once rather than being hands-on for only one patient. One really important concept is you cannot be the immediate disaster team head and the doctor for a single patient at the same time. You lose your ability to keep a broad view of what's going on. So empowering your people to be able to do those things that allow you to do your most important job is really important. When you know something's coming your way, you have to think about the incident and define a few priorities. Is this going to be a single incident where you're gonna need all of your resources up front, like a mass shooter? Or do you need resources that are spread out over days to weeks for something like a hurricane or a flood? Is this a man-made event like a terrorist bombing? Those have a lot higher security concerns than environmental events. Almost every mass shooter had a plan to target first responders and medical personnel. So you cannot assume that the people that are coming into your emergency room are not the perpetrators of this event. You have to be vigilant and have security available. If you have an environmental event that's happening, you are much more likely to lose power, communications, and to be cut off from your resupply sources. So you have to think a lot more about how to ration your supplies, ration your personnel, and be available to them over a long period of time. After you think about what's coming in, then you have to look at what you have and what you need based on what's coming to your emergency room. I call this the critical resource assessment. If I have an active shooter event, I know I need a lot of surgeons and a lot of blood. In my chlorine gas release, surgeons don't help me at all, but I need a lot of ventilators and I need some C. Bernie type antidotes. Your resource assessment is driven from what event is coming in your door. 
And once you know what you have, you can identify the shortfalls and start thinking about how to address that. You can move patients to resources. In rural hospitals, we do that all the time. We take a patient who has appendicitis and we move them to a surgeon. Sometimes you move resources to patients. So if I have an event that I know that I need a lot of blood, I'm gonna call down to my local blood center and say, send me all the blood you have on that first helo that comes up so I can start resuscitating at the point of injury. You can get really creative. The physicians who responded to the Las Vegas massacre wrote a beautiful article about putting two patients on one ventilator by taking some two people who have about the same tidal volumes and putting them on Y-tubing. You double the tidal volume on the vent and you can double the amount of patients that you can ventilate that way. And then after you do all of that, you have to triage. And those triage priorities drive from what type of patients you have coming in and what resources you have available. Doing that in a mass casualty situation is much different than the triage that we do on a daily basis. And having training in a mass casualty triage paradigm like START or SALT can be incredibly helpful. And that training is actually available for free through the National Disaster Life Support Foundation on their website. Thank you.